Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Now, typically on this show, I like to keep things to the more abstract, more in the realm of theory, um, prediction, instead of focusing on the concrete hot button issues of the day. And when I do touch upon those, I typically am not trying to push a narrative, take a side. I really try to give the most objective, grounded perspective on that reality as I possibly can based on my own knowledge and understanding and background. Now, I don't think it's any secret that I tend to fall a little bit more to the conservative side of things, but I'll be damned if you'll find me defending people like Ben Shapiro or Steven Crowder. Not so much because I disagree with some of their understanding or reading or positions on things. It's just that I think that a lot of these high-level political commentators are just grifters. I don't think they truly believe what they say. I think they read the winds and they shift with the opinions of their audience. And so while I may agree with a conservative like Ben Shapiro or Steven Crowder, if we went line by line on the issues, I don't like to follow them or associate myself with them because I don't think that they truly believe what they are saying. I have a lot more respect for somebody like Destiny or even Bill Maher, who I can't stand listening to a lot of the time. But they have been pretty consistent through their career. There are lines that they have been unwilling to cross. So as a burgeoning political talking head, I think it's my responsibility to not get swept up into those waves and to present things as I believe them with the best information that I have to you guys. So then you can construct your worldview and you can take what I say and, and you can integrate it or you can reject it or you, you, know, you at least have my opinion and my real true perspective on things. So because of all this, I was really excited to hear that Yenmi Park was coming to a university near me and she was giving a speech. If you don't know who Yenmi Park is, she's a North Korean defector who escaped North Korea when she was a child. She then moved to South Korea and now resides in the United States. She's written a couple books. Um, she's touted as a human rights activist. Now she travels around to universities and conferences and give speeches detailing her experience in North Korea and her escape and then her now experiences in the West. But she said some interesting things over the years. I've never sat down and listened to a whole speech of hers. I've never listened to an entire podcast of hers. I know she was on Joe Rogan. I know she's talked to Jordan Peterson. Uh, but I've never sat down and listened to her speeches. I would just hear clips and the things that she said struck me as being exaggerated. Now, I had no real reason to believe that. I don't know a whole lot about North Korea, but the things that she said just didn't seem like they were rooted in what was possible, right? She talked about how there was one train in North Korea and sometimes the people had to push it. And North Korea has one train go to one distance like a once a month. <laughs> and like here it would take like one hour to go to the other place. In North Korea it would take a month at least to go because there's no electricity. And sometimes people have to push the train. They have to push the train. Yeah. I don't think that there's any way, no matter how many people you have, that you can push a train. Trains weigh more than like a blue whale. What the fuck? I mean, these are enormous machines. Um, so that struck me as odd. I've also seen her say that romantic love is not a thing in North Korea, that they don't really have a word for love because you're only supposed to love the, the Kims. And I didn't believe that. And so I started looking into it and multiple North Korean defectors have refuted that claim. Uh, North Korean experts, people who have lived in North Korea, like as uh, businessmen or academics, they've, they've studied that and there's like, no, romantic love definitely exists in North Korea. Uh, the government tries to push people to marry other people who are good revolutionary comrades, but from what I could tell, people don't really look for that in a partner. They look for the same thing that the rest of us do, compatibility, um, attraction, right? Maybe family connections in, in the case of North Korea. Um, but yeah, so some of these things that she says, they're a little bit exaggerated. There's just from the surface, I, I can already tell. And so because of that, I was really excited to go listen to her speak because kind of having these questions, having these doubts, I wondered if maybe these clips were just taken out of context or if it's just that English is not her first language and maybe she's confusing some things, messing them up a little bit. And so I wanted to give her a fair shake. So I went to go see this presentation that she gave and I was kind of disappointed. So the first thing that she does is she gets up and she says, wow, hello, you know, I'm, I'm probably the first North Korean to ever visit this town. 
and that just struck me as odd i was like well, well that might not be true maybe it is true but why do you have to lead with that and then she said that in north korea she's told that americans are all bastards and they had to call americans bastards but she said you guys are the nicest bastards i've ever met so hello bastards and so i could already tell she was playing a character when she was getting up there and speaking not to say that what she was going to say was not true but i could definitely tell that she was trying to play to the audience which hey i get it you know every speaker has to have kind of a personality um it's just that that one in particular kind of grades me a little bit right so but i i wanted to keep an open mind so i, I sat through the whole thing i listened to what she had to say so she continues on in her speech and she details her childhood growing up in north korea she talks about how they didn't have enough food so they had to gather wild food sometimes they had to eat insects she talked about her dad being arrested for trading in the black market and being sent to jail for 10 years uh, she talked about her experience with north korean healthcare. spoiler alert it's not really very good uh, which i think is expected i definitely believe that but again she, some of the details just didn't really add up and they didn't make a lot of sense to me when i look at states states are primarily concerned with security and stability at least that's how i understand them and read them and some of the things she spoke about like just dead bodies piling up all over the place she says there's dead bodies everywhere flowing in the river and just on the side of the road because people are starving to death and nobody does anything about it i just find that difficult to believe like it just didn't make sense to me that you would just leave dead bodies laying around why aren't the people burying them why isn't the government doing something about it yeah i understand it's not a very responsive government it's a totalitarian state but it's just not good practice to leave dead bodies laying around everywhere it's not a good look for the government especially if you're trying to at least pretend that you're this socialist workers paradise and so i was like that just doesn't sound correct to me then she talked about a woman being publicly executed in a stadium for watching a hollywood movie i was like that again just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense you know imprisonments you know that i could definitely believe that but public execution for watching a movie it just seems so over the top cartoonishly evil that i just didn't believe that on its surface so what really got me the most was when she was speaking about her experience escaping into china she said that her sister went before her and then her and her mother followed a little bit after a couple days or weeks after i think and they were linked up with these chinese smugglers and so the smugglers got them out of north korea they lived in a border town right at the north of north korea right on the border with china so they got over pretty easy um and then these chinese smugglers decided that they were going to um what do i have to say here not to get filtered by youtube um essayed i'm sure you guys all know what that means um they were going to essay her and she was just a little girl i think she said she was like 12 or 13 um and her mother begged them not to offer to take her place there um and so then she said she witnessed her mother being essayed by these these chinese smugglers and i believe it i i have no reason not to believe her um, i have no reason to believe that chinese smugglers would be above that taking advantage of people trying to escape into North Korea. So I definitely believe her. And then she talked about being in China and there was kind of a continual cycle of that sort of abuse and taking advantage of until she finally escaped into Mongolia, which also made me question because she just said, oh yeah, I just somehow I made it across the Gobi Desert in negative 40 degree weather. Again, I'm not saying that that didn't happen. It's just maybe she's leaving out some details. Like, did they have a car? Was there some kind of guide? I mean, she literally just said she walked across the Gobi Desert in negative 40 degree weather. That's difficult to believe unless you have some kind of mechanism or vehicle to get yourself there. What gave me pause was not the content of what she was saying, but it was how she was presenting it. So as she started to talk about this, there were two instances in this part of the story that was getting her very emotional but there were two instances in this story where she broke character so right at the very beginning she starts to kind of get choked up tear up a little bit um, when she starts talking about the price that she was sold for and it was i forget it was just a few hundred dollars it was a very small amount of money that she was sold for really kind of highlighting um the the inhumanity of the system and how worthless life is seen by the north koreans um, or the, in this case, the Chinese smugglers buying North Koreans. And so she started to kind of well up and tear up, understandably, right? Uh, very emotional, very traumatizing uh, events there. But then this baby started crying in the crowd and she broke character and like went from somebody that you think is really about to lose it 
to just totally flat, you know, just as calm as I'm talking to you right now. She's like, oh, it's okay, little one, don't worry. And and then she says, you know, don't worry, I have, I have one at home. You know, I'm just kind of trying to tell the mother, oh, don't worry about the baby crying, right? So and then she goes back into the story and continues on. And then again, she gets very emotional, like very, very emotional, um, like on the verge of just breaking down openly crying. And then something similar happened. Another baby was in the crowd kind of cooing. And she's like, oh, there, there, little one. Again, totally breaking character. It's it's hard for me to describe. It probably makes me sound like a bad person who doesn't believe survivors of SA. Um, but that's not, that is not who I am, right? I have multiple friends who have experienced that. It's terrible. Um, and it is very emotional for them. And so I understand and I'm sympathetic. But the fact that she was just able to turn off and on the waterworks made me feel as though she was playing it up, playing a character. And that made me feel a little bit icky. Again, knowing people who have experienced that, it just made me feel kind of weird that she would do that intentionally. She said while she was in China, she learned that there is a South Korea from these South Korean businessmen that were uh, taking advantage of her. And I just wasn't really sure I believe that that was the first time she had first heard about South Korea. North Korea makes it very clear that the South and the United States are their enemies, but part of North Korea's official policy until just a couple of months ago was that they wanted to peacefully reunify with the South. They were part of the Olympic team for the South in the 2018 Olympics. They had a joint team. Their hockey team was integrated, and so I don't believe that that's the first time she ever heard of South Korea. She then decides to move from China to Mongolia, because in China, she's still not safe. China has an extradition treaty with North Korea. So does Russia, which are the two countries that border North Korea. So if you want to escape, you need to make it to Mongolia. <laughs> Mongolia will send you to South Korea. And so she manages to do that. Uh, again, doesn't really give a lot of detail as to how she got across the Gobi Desert. She just said, quote, somehow, I managed to make it across in negative 40 degree weather. Not the most convincing. I'm wondering if there was some kind of mechanism or vehicle that allowed her to get across the desert. Um, but then eventually she manages to get into South Korea, being sent from Mongolia. And South Korea has a program in which all North Koreans are considered South Korean citizens. And so if you can make it to South Korea, uh, then you're good. So she lives in South Korea for about five years, and she doesn't give any details about her time in South Korea. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later as to probably why she didn't do that, but she didn't really give a lot of details about South Korea. Eventually, she says she makes it to America. What the fuck is a she said the first place that she went in America was Tyler, Texas, and again, she starts with the whole fish out of water thing. She talks about how she went into Walmart. That was the first place she went. And she saw all the different apples and the different types of fruit and the toothpaste. There were so many different types and she was just so amazed by the options. And I was like, I don't believe that. You said you just said you lived in South Korea for five years. Like, I know South Korea has grocery stores. I know that they have supermarkets. This cannot be the first time that you have seen two different colors of apples or two different types of toothpaste. So she, again, she's playing up the whole fish out of water, I'm kind of naive thing to the crowd. And so I like, she's totally got this all scripted. It's all nailed down. And I understand as a speaker, that's what you need to do. But again, it just made me feel like she was being inauthentic, just really playing to the crowd about her experience, which is this hor harrowing, horrible experience on its own. You know, playing to the crowd, it just didn't really seem to be necessary. But after detailing her account of getting out of North Korea, her experience in South Korea and the United States, then this is when the shift came. And this was not a shift that I expected to happen. She then started talking about every single conservative talking point that you could imagine. It was as if they took Jordan Peterson and like extracted his soul and had it possess the body of a Korean lady. Because she hit on everything. She hit on academia, uh, being bad, how it's full of communists who want to destroy the country. She talked about uh, policing language and hate speech, thought crimes. She talked about equity being a bad thing and how that led to North Korea being such a terrible nation. 
She advocated for more fossil fuel usage. She condemned the elite trying to force everybody to eat bugs. She said she didn't want to eat another bug in her entire life. It's gross. She even made comments about the southern border being open and made a joke about there only being two genders, like a man is a man, a woman is a woman. Now, I don't disagree with anything that she said. Those are all positions that I hold. It was just very bizarre that she went from talking about North Korea to then saying, if we accept any of these things, the liberals are going to turn America into North Korea. I told you it was only a matter of time before the liberals came for our pancakes. Bro, you have been saying that a lot. And I just didn't buy that argument. I felt like that was a stretch. I felt like it was alarmist. And I felt like it was disingenuous. And so hitting every single talking point that you could expect to hear from Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Steven Crowder, even like Elon Musk or Joe Rogan, just put a bad taste in my mouth. It was very strange. I don't really think that I believe that she believes all of those things. It made her come off as very manufactured. And the impression from the people that I went to see this with and the people sitting next to me, strangers, you could tell that they didn't believe what she was saying, especially towards the end. What really got me irritated at, at the end of this speech was she then took questions. And so I got in line because I wanted to ask her a question about the relationship between North Korea and South Korea and how there actually have been strides made in the last decade. Um, the Korean War was ended while Trump was president. He was the first president to meet with Kim Jong-un. Um, Kim Jong-un met with Moon Jae-in, the prime minister of South Korea at that time, for the first time since they split up. So with all those steps being made, I wanted to ask her if she thought there was a possibility that, not necessarily that North and South Korea would reunite, but that maybe North Korea could open up a little bit, that they could maybe become like China, right? Communists with North Korean characteristics. They could open up their markets a little bit, they could get some foreign investment, have some factories built, and maybe alleviate the suffering of the people just a little bit. They wouldn't become a democratic state by any stretch of the imagination, but they could resemble, again, more China or even the later Soviet Union, where the people have a little bit more freedom, a little bit of mobility, a little bit of money, and they're no longer just starving in the street. I didn't get a chance to ask my question, though. I was at the back of the line, and everybody in front of me wanted to spend one minute just praising her, hailing her. One guy said something like, I'm fangirling out so hard right now. I, I just, I love your work. I've been a follower of you for a long time. And I don't even think he said anything. A bunch of boomers and these you know weird libertarians going up there and just like singing her praises, saying how inspirational, how wonderful she is. And then you had people asking questions that were just not touched upon by her speech that would also be just typical right-wing talking points. Somebody asked about the demographic crisis in the West and in South Korea and you know what could be done to fix that. And it kind of just came off as him complaining that women don't want to sleep with him. That may come off as kind of mean. Um, but her answer was basically what you would expect. She said that, oh, yeah, it's a great danger, right? We need more people. We need more babies. I think she said she had two kids. She said that North Korea's population is about stable at 25 million, but said that South Korea's population is plummeting. It's probably the worst demographics in the world, which is true. Um, but they have 50 million people. So a parody being reached there or North Korea overtaking them would take quite a while if that was going to happen. Somebody else asked her if they thought that North Korea was an imminent threat to South Korea because he had studied in South Korea and he knew people from South Korea and they nobody thought it was a serious thing. Everybody was joking about it. All the people who have to do military service are like, yeah, no, they're never going to invade. I'm just wasting my time here. Um, but she said, oh no, North Korea is a real true threat to South Korea. They want to come and take them by force, which again that's not their policy now and it wasn't in the past it was always peaceful reunification now obviously people lie but they haven't really done anything to make us believe that they really wanted to come down across the 38th parallel and invade south korea and we know that they don't have the capacity for that she then said that north korean's nuclear program is an imminent threat to the united states she said their number one goal was to destroy america and I'm like, this just sounds like I'm listening to somebody talk about Saddam Hussein in 2003 again. Like, that is not North Korea's goal. They know that they can't attain that goal. Like, I'm not an expert on North Korea, and I'm not inside Kim Jong-un's mind, but he's got a good thing going. 
you know, they, they have all this propaganda and they say how strong they are and they tell people they can defeat the United States. They've got a museum of stuff they captured in the Korean War. I think one of our ships is in there. But Kim Jong-un knows the situation that he's in. He knows he's got it really good. He himself has got it really good. And he knows that the reason he's got it so good is because he's got nuclear weapons and we don't want to do anything to provoke him too much. There's a good song and dance that the United States and North Korea do that's been working pretty well for the last 80 years. North Korea saber rattles a little bit. We negotiate with them. They want more food and material and the sanctions lifted. And so we lift some of the sanctions and then they go about their business. And then eventually we get a new president in or they do something that makes us upset. So then we put more sanctions on. And then that's the status quo for a while. And then North Korea saber rattles again. And the, the process starts all over again. So Kim Jong-un knows exactly what he's got. He does not have any interest in destroying the United States. She also blamed China for enabling North Korea, which is definitely true. But she painted them as though they're like best friends. China, to my understanding, sees North Korea as more of a liability because they've got kind of this rogue state that threatens to nuke everybody, launches missiles over Japan. And while North Korea may not want to intentionally instigate something, you know, if one of those rockets falls short and lands on Kyoto, that would be a really big problem for them. And China knows that would be a problem for them too. So I think China would love to get them under control a little bit. They like having a buffer zone between them and South Korea because they see South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, um, even, even the Vietnamese and the Philippines as a threat, kind of containing them in their ocean. And so they want a little bit of a buffer between them and South Korea. So when I got home, I got online and I started researching her. I wanted to see if other people felt the same way that I did, if anybody had done any research into her background and her time in North Korea, see if what she was saying was true. And I found a lot. And going a long way back, she kind of made her debut in 2014, speaking at a conference in South Korea. And even as early as that, there were articles being written by other defectors saying what she's saying is not true. Other experts in North Korea saying that what she's saying is not true. And people bringing up her time on a South Korean variety show called Now On My Way To Meet You, where other North Korean defectors, all women, get on and, and they do different things, challenges, things like that. It's kind of a popular thing in South Korea and Japan. But anyway, when speaking, she said that she never had to eat bugs. She said that uh, that was something other people had to do. Her mother confirmed this. Her mother was on the show. She said that she was pretty well off, that her mom was able to afford Chanel bags that were smuggled into the country. And so they, they were doing okay and they were reasonably well for North Koreans, right? Not that it wasn't difficult, probably more difficult than here, but they were much better off than everybody else around them. And so this idea that she was this very poor girl growing up in the mountains is just not true. <laughs> 뭐 풀도 뜯어 먹던 얘기, 뭐 먹고 살기 어려운 얘기하면 예주 형 아, 저런 거 없는데 뭐 이런 경우가 좀 있었어요. 네. 왜 그랬죠 예주 형은 어렸을 때 그런 걸못 겪었나요? 근데 그 정도는 아니었고 굶지는 않았어요. 굶지는 않고 이제와 같이 네, 너네 무슨 밥을 먹니 하면 이밥 먹는다, 옥수수 밥을 먹는다는 몰랐어요. 수련하면서 우리 예주가 북한의 질태를 더잘 알게 된 계기라고 생각해요. 그 예주 형은 그럼요. 여기 와서 배운 것 같아요. 네. 그러니까. 자기가 어떤 때는 엄마한테 전화를 해요. 이 방송을 녹화를 하고 엄마 내가 진짜 북한 아이가 얽힌 어른가 다른 언니들이 하는 말이 무슨 말인지 저, 자기는 더 전혀 전혀 모르겠대요. 아 자꾸 거짓말을 한다는 거예요. 그러니까 왜? 처음에 와서 그러더라고요. 네. 그래 음. 제가 방송을 들어 후에 모니터를 해보면 다 진짜 말이 맞거든요. 네. 북한 사람들 모인 데 가서는 말을 많이 조심을 해요. 네, 잘못 말하면 북한 사람들이 많이 격분해 하더라고요. 네. 제가 우리 딸 보고도 방송에 나가서 내가 할 말이 아닐 땐 크게 말을 하지 말라고 해요. 아, 네. 하지 못하게 해요 아예. 네? 철없이 보인다고 그러다 괜히 미움게 산다고 언니들 앞에서 이상한 소리 하지 말고 그냥 수긍만 해라 너는. Again, her claim that somebody was executed for watching a, a foreign movie. When she's in South Korea, she says it's a South Korean film. When she's in Europe, she says it's James Bond. When she's in the United States, she says it's just a Hollywood movie. Uh, that doesn't happen. Everybody who's from the same town that she's from in the North, who's left around the same time, other North Korean experts, 
they say that public executions really aren't a thing unless it's like a very high crime, like true treason. Um, watching a Disney film or Titanic, like she said, it wouldn't get you executed. You might get some jail time, but you could also just bribe the police and you'd be on your way. There's a lot more there to her story, and that could be a whole other video in and of itself. And I don't want to get into it, so I'm just going to link one of the videos down that I thought covered it pretty well. This girl, I think, is a lefty, and so her skew on this, especially as it comes to the enemy's time being kind of manufactured into a libertarian free market speaker, is, uh, you know, slanted in that way. But the information that she looked up and, and presents, so far as I can tell, is sound and is true. Yenmi Park, if we're being as generous as possible, is really playing up the misery factor in North Korea and exaggerating. At the worst, she's just a flat out liar. So you may say, what's your point? You know, why, why does it matter if this one East Celeb is lying or exaggerating? Like North Korea is a terrible place and a lot of what she's saying is true. And I even said, I agree with a lot of her talking points when it comes to contemporary American politics. So why am I calling her out? And hey, you know, I understand the argument and I understand the grift, right? You know, we gotta eat. Everyone's gotta eat. She's got some celebrity people like listening to her talk and she's made a career out of it. I don't know, what, am, what am I trying to do here, right? But I think the difference is that I really believe everything that I say. I don't present things that I don't agree with. I may joke, I may even exaggerate a little bit here and there, but I really do fundamentally believe everything that I'm saying. I don't think that she does. I mean, I'm pretty pragmatic myself. If somebody is a grifter and they don't truly believe the things that they say, but I do agree with the points that they make, then yeah, I'm not going to call them out. I'm going to kind of tacitly support them. I'm not going to hitch my whole cart to their horse, but you know, I'm going to give them a little bit of support because I think that the message that they're getting out, I think that the change that they're bringing is good. I, fundamentally, I think that it, it is good. But in her case, I think she's doing a lot more damage than she's doing good. First of all, because she's pretty well known as a blatant liar, anything that she attaches herself to is immediately called into question because she herself is a very dishonest person and is not a true believer in anything that she says. And so she's a very easy avenue for the left to attack the right, who seems to have totally hooked up to her. They, the right is totally in love with her. They, they listen to what she says. She's very popular among the right. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think attaching yourself to something like that or someone like that is damaging because it's an easy avenue for people to attack you. You know, all these left-wing commentators have already done it. Hassan and Vosh and Destiny, you know, they've all been able to pick apart her argument, make her look silly, make her look like a liar, and then say, see, these right-wingers are so dumb and gullible that they believe the lying North Korean lady. I think it's bad for other survivors of North Korea, other defectors, because it undermines their true stories. You know, North Korea is bad enough. I do believe North Korea is not a nice place to be. But when you exaggerate, when you talk about how you have to push trains, when you talk about a cycle of children eating rats and then the children dying and then the rats eating the children and bodies just piling up outside the hospital, people being arrested and sentenced to death by public execution for watching Titanic. I think it undermines the more banal and mundane horrors that people suffer. Police abuse, uh, starvation, not having access to resources. And ultimately, I think it's bad for the people that are still living in North Korea because what she has done is she turns North Korea into this easy punching bag for the right, right? Oh, if if we do this or we don't do this, then we're gonna end up like North Korea. North Korea, North Korea, North Korea. North Korea becomes the ultimate evil. But what does the United States do when it decides somebody is the ultimate evil, right? Gaddafi, Saddam, Mubarak. Not so great, right? Not so great for the people. And this is my biggest problem with the enemy, is I think she is creating an explosive and dangerous situation regarding North Korea. You know, North Korea is a small state. They are weak. The only thing they have going for them is that they have nuclear weapons and to a certain degree they have China's backing. But they have China's backing in part because they have nuclear weapons. So they're a nuclear state and she's creating them to be this pariah. She is getting people to hate them. Um, and she is, I don't think explicitly but the people get the idea the impression they want to support the nice korean lady they feel bad for her 
oh, well, we should just go at, invade North Korea. We should topple the Kim regime. We should do something about this, right? Because Yanmi Park suffered so horribly in North Korea. She gets her army of simps and boomers to push this agenda. And that's a horrible idea. Not only is it bad for us, because it's just not in our strategic interest to attack North Korea. It's not a fight that we could easily win. And it would cause untold suffering to the people in North Korea. But even if the United States doesn't physically attack North Korea to try to liberate them, I'm not saying that's something that's likely to happen. I think it's just you're making it more likely that that could happen. And I just think that's irresponsible. But again, even if that doesn't happen, the idea of working, collaborating, continuing to make steps with North Korea to bring them into the world, to de-escalate tensions, I think becomes increasingly difficult when the entire American population has been galvanized against North Korea and sees them as nothing but bad, a total pariah, a terrible state that should be overthrown. It makes it difficult for steps to be made to that end that maybe someday North Korea could open up a little bit, like China, right? That's probably the best outcome for North Korea right now, because Kim's not going anywhere. And I don't know who's going to take over after him, but th this process is going to have to be slow. North Korea is not going to become a liberal democratic nation overnight, and it probably never will be a liberal democracy. That's just a fantasy. And I think that's my biggest issue with Yenmi Park, is that the message that she preaches directly interferes with the ability of North and South Korea and North Korea and the United States to come to some sort of terms, to have some sort of understanding and possibly alleviating at least a little bit of the suffering of the North Korean people if they were able to be brought into the global economy, brought into the global community at least a little bit. But that's enough about what I think. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments. Am I just bullying the poor North Korean lady? Or do you think that there's something to what I'm saying here? Let me know down in the comments. And thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, make sure to like and subscribe. And I will catch you guys on the next one.